welcome to the webcast. Um, my name is Sarah, and I'm your host today. And so before we dive into the webcast with Eric, I just wanted to touch on a few housekeeping items. First thing, all attendee lines are muted. However, I want to keep this interactive, so I encourage you to ask your questions in the chat box in the GoToMeeting console. You should find that possibly on the right side of your screen. So please be sure to ask that. I will be monitoring that um, during the webcast. So we will try to answer your questions at the end of the webinar during our Q&A time. Also, today's session is being recorded. And as attendees, you will all receive the link to the recording via an email later this week. So look, be on the lookout for that um, in your email. And it will also be available on beyondtrust.com. So at this point, I'd like to turn the phone over to Eric. Eric, please take it away. Welcome. Excellent, and thank you. And I'll tell you, this is going to be one of the quickest webcasts out there. Is your security program risky or risk focused? It is risky. Thank you for attending the webcast. No, uh, most of you are on this <laughs> call because you know the answer uh, to that question. I, I jokingly wanted to rename this How to Turn Your Security Program from Risky to Risk Focused. Because unfortunately, if you watch the news, pick up a newspaper, open a magazine, organizations are getting broken into left and right, and it seems like the adversaries have the upper hand. Unfortunately, they do have the upper hand. The good news is they don't have to have the upper hand. Security is not difficult. It's not hard if we just focus in on some core areas. So instead of going in, and taking you through a lot of the problem of all the threats and all the breaches and all the issues that are out there, I'm sure you can do that research on your own. I want to focus in not on complaining about the problem, but focusing in on the solution. How can we go in and actually manage and control risk in our environment? How can we go in and start to secure our organization? Now, just so we can put this in context, so we can get through within an hour, we possibly can't cover every possible risk across your entire environment. So what we're really looking at are how do we control and manage your biggest threat that's out there today. If you look at what attackers are targeting, they are not targeting operating systems made by Microsoft or Linux or Apple or any of those. They're targeting an operating system that's a much harder operating system for us to secure. It can't be managed with configuration control. It's very, very hard to patch. And that operating system I'm referring to that adversaries target today is the human operating system, the brain. That's what they're typically targeting. So what we're really going to be focusing in on is how do we control and manage those user-based risks within your environment. Because if you look at most of the major attacks and breaches that have happened over the last several years, yes, the source of the attack is external. The problem is, what is the cause of damage? The cause of damage in almost all those cases are insider threats. The adversary is targeting people within your organization and tricking them to opening an attachment or clicking on a link that they normally wouldn't do if they knew the true intent of their actions. So that's really what we're looking at is how do we minimize that greatest cause of damage, that accidental insider threat. And if we can do a better job to reduce that exposure, we can increase our overall security. And we're going to be using the critical controls as our model. And hopefully, we have repeat visitors, because this is the third part in our three-part series. Or maybe it's a fourth part. Maybe we'll just keep going. Right? We can make more controls. But right now, uh, this is part three, where we're taking different controls and looking at how they can control, manage, and secure your organization. So let's start off by looking at what are the steps that we need to do to manage risk, to increase our security, and then how does that map to our critical controls, and which ones should we focus in on? First, 
everything we do in security is all about protecting, controlling, and managing your critical data. If you want to summarize security, it's real easy. Security is all about understanding, managing, and mitigating risk to your critical information. That's what it's all about. The problem is many organizations do not take a data-centric approach to security. They take a device-centric approach. Well, what's the problem with taking a device-centric approach? Devices change way too often. They're always coming out with new phones, new devices, new components that people want to put on your network. So if your security program is trying to align with how do we secure, lock down, and protect every new device that comes out, you're never, ever, ever going to win that game. However, if we focus on data center security, where we determine what our critical data is, we put security controls around that critical data, and then any device that manages, stores, or analyzes that information now has to have those same controls in place. Now we have a way to secure our enterprise. Now I know saying taking a data centric approach to security is easy, but how do we actually do it? Well, the way you do it is by doing a three-step process. So one of the biggest game changers that I do with our customers is I take a piece of paper and I fold it into three columns. Now, of course, you can use an electronic version of PowerPoint slide with three columns, but here's what I want you to do. In the first column, I want you to list what are your critical assets and the business processes that support them. So for your organization or business unit, what are the five or six most critical assets and the business processes that support that? In the second column, what are the threats to those critical assets and business processes that have the highest likelihood of occurring? Then in the third column, what are the vulnerabilities based on the critical assets and the likely threats that would have the biggest impact to your organization and list those vulnerabilities. The trick for making this work is you only have one slide or one piece of paper. You can't go in and have 20 pieces of paper. You need five or six in each column, and then guess what magically happens? That right-hand column where you list those vulnerabilities, that becomes your security roadmap. That's what you focus on. Then, over months, after all those vulnerabilities are reduced to an acceptable level of risk, then you rework those vulnerabilities. So the way we do this with our customers is that first column, those critical assets, we review that every six months. The threats that have the highest likelihood, we review quarterly, and the vulnerabilities that have the biggest impact, depending on the amount of effort they take to reduce, we often review monthly. So now that becomes your security process that you follow in your environment, tracking everything against that critical data. Now the other thing that's important is that you do data discovery. When I was growing up, it was before they had cell phones and all these other tracking devices, and when we would go out, my parents really had no idea where we were going. And honestly, with the way I was as a crazy kid, that was probably better for my parents. I, I joke with them that if they actually could track me and knew what I was doing, they probably would have a lot more gray hairs and much higher blood pressure. But they used to do these commercials on TV. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? And it was meant to raise awareness of knowing what your kids are doing. Well, now that we have cell phones, we don't need those commercials, but we should do new ones. It is 10 p.m. Do you know where your data is? Do you know who's accessing or going after it? And the problem, most organizations don't. When we go into our customers and we do data discovery exercises, very few of them really know or understand where their data is. Now, let's be fair. 
when I say what's your most critical data and what servers does it reside on, they usually come back and will tell us four servers. And the good news is the data is on those four servers. What's the problem? It's on five other servers that they didn't know about. Now, if you believe that the data is only on four servers, you're only going to secure, protect, and lock down those four servers. You're not going to lock down the other five. Now, if you're an adversary, which systems are you going to go after? The four that are locked down and secure or the five that the company doesn't know about and is wide open? We all know the answer to that. So the first thing, the first step we need to do if we want to start having an effective security program is mapping everything against our critical assets tied to threats and vulnerabilities. Now, you might say, but Eric, the title of this presentation was risk-based approach. I don't see risk there. Yes, you do. What is risk? Risk equals threat times vulnerability. So what did we magically do with this three-column chart? You calculated the risk against your critical assets. So that's the first starting point that we want to focus our energy and effort on. Now, last year, I was given a research project. And the project was this. I was given 10 companies that had major, major breaches and 10 companies that were winning in security. And the project was determine the difference. Why were these 10 companies losing and these 10 companies winning? Now, most people, if you were given that generic problem set, you're probably thinking easy, right? easy peasy. You're going to go in and there's big differences. There wasn't. The budgets, the amount of money they were spending was fairly similar across both groups. The technology they were deploying was pretty similar across most groups. So here I start off this research project that I thought was going to be easy, and I'm now in this situation where I'm scratching my head going, I don't know. I I'm not sure why these companies are winning and losing. So I'm getting a little frustrated. And then the aha moment was when I went and started talking to those security folks. When I started going into the companies that were losing and getting broken into, and I started asking them questions, okay, you spent 300K here. What was the risk you were trying to reduce? The answers I got back was, I don't know. When I went to the companies that were winning and properly defending and securing their enterprise, when I went over to them and I said, what risk were you trying to reduce by spending this money in security? they could answer every single time. So if you want to know the secret to why organizations are getting broken into or are not getting broken into, it's simple. Before you spend an hour of your time or a dollar of your budget on anything in the name of security, ask yourself three questions. What is the risk? Is it the highest priority risk? And this is the most cost-effective way of reducing the risk. And this is the moment of truth. Dun, dun, dun. Take your 2014 and 2015 security roadmap and put it in a spreadsheet. In that spreadsheet have three columns. The first column, identify the risk you're reducing with each one of those items. In the second column, determine is it the highest priority risk out of everything else you have going on? And third, determine is that the most cost-effective way of reducing it? Now, if you can go through and you can answer those questions for everything you're doing over the next 12 to 18 months, congratulations. You are behaving very much like organizations that are winning. However, if you have trouble doing this exercise, if you can't, answer those questions. Warning, warning, warning. You are behaving very much like organizations that are losing and getting broken into. So you have two options. If you're in that second category where you can't answer these three questions for what you're doing, option one is wait to get compromised, or option two is change how you're doing security to focus in on the highest priority risks your organization.
the next big problem we have is organizations are not thinking like the offense. If you want to be good at the defense, you have to think like the offense. I'm excited because yesterday was 100 days until football season starts, right? I love football. That's one of my favorite sports to watch. Normally, at this point in the conversation, I would go in because one of my good friends who works at Beyond Security is a Patriots fan and I'm a Giants fan. I would usually make a football joke, but based on how the Giants performed last season, yeah, I'll just pass on that one, right? Uh, there's not a whole lot of trash talking I can do uh, at this point. But the good news is you got to give Eli Manning a lot of credit last season. He completed a lot of passes. The problem, they were to the other team, right? So we got to work on that whole jersey uh, thing of who to throw the football to there. So I'll trash talk my own team until the season starts. But if you're on the defense for a football team, the way you get ready for the season is to understand the offense. How does the offense work? Now here's where the problem comes in. That's where most companies put their energy and effort. They focus a lot on stopping the adversaries from getting in. So they do patching, locking down services. That's all good. That's all good. The issue is why is the adversary winning? Because that's where they focus their energy and effort. When we go in and we do specialized advanced threat pen tests for our customers, if my engineers are having trouble exploiting or breaking in, I tell them that's because they didn't do enough recon and scanning. If you know enough about your target, if you do enough recon and scanning where you know everything about how they work and operate, exploitation is one of the easiest steps out there. So therefore, if we want to win and do better in security, we need to put more energy and effort in how somebody can recon and more importantly, what information they can find out about our organization. Step three, you can't protect what you don't know. If the offense knows more about your organization and how they work than you do, you're not going to be successful. And this one really, really comes to mind because I got called about three months ago from a fairly large company, and they says, listen, Eric, we just got called by law enforcement, and they found a lot of information about our organization out on the Internet. So we're pretty sure we've been compromised. But we're really confused. I said, well, why are you confused? Well, one of the things law enforcement gave us was a network map of our environment. And it was completely inaccurate. It wasn't even close or realistic to our organization. So we're wondering if maybe this really wasn't our site. I said, well, evidently you're concerned if you're calling me. Why are you concerned? They said, because all the MAC addresses on the diagram are correct. And we all know that while MAC addresses can technically be changed, they're typically not. They're burnt in uh, to the NIC on your system. So therefore, the fact that all the MACs were the same made them really, really curious. So we took the network visibility map that law enforcement found out on the Internet. We took the company's network diagram, and they were right, totally, completely different. We then went in and analyzed their network and built out how their network was really configured and set up. And if I had to give grades, the network diagram that law enforcement found that was created by the adversary I would have given them a 95% score. When I took the company's own network map, I would have gave them a 50. The company didn't even know how their network was configured designed. And the scary part is the adversary had a much better idea of the setup of that environment. Now question, if the adversary's network diagram is 95% accurate and yours is 50% accurate, you don't even have a chance. Right? It's not going to be happening. Right? You're not going to win there. So you need to understand what's in your organization. 
This is what I call the foundational components. In my opinion, there are three things you must have. I've gone through, I've spent a lot of time dissecting down all these major incidents that have occurred and have kept doing root cause analysis of why, why, why is it happening. And it really comes down to not having three foundational things in place. Asset inventory, configuration management, and change control. If you do not know what's plugged into your network, if you do not know how those devices are configured, and you don't manage and control change in the environment, you're not going to win. It, it really, if those things are not there, it's not going to happen. So in terms of action items, give yourself a report card right now. If you are fully doing that item, give yourself an A. If you're partially doing that item, give yourself a B. If you're hardly ever doing that item, give yourself a C. And if you have no idea if you're doing that item, give yourself a D. If you score below a B in any one of those three areas, asset inventory, configuration management, or change control, you have work to do. You have to go in and focus in on those areas. One of the best ways of understanding and knowing your environment is by creating a network visibility map. A network visibility map lets you see what systems are visible, what ports are open, and what services are running on each of those respective ports. Then your goal is instead of doing a bottom-up approach, which is what most organizations do, which is patch, 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 I want you to do a top-down approach where you go in and you prune the tree. Look at every single visible system and say, does it absolutely need to be visible on the network? Then close down any ports that are not needed and upgrade or remove any extraneous services that are not required within your environment. That's the best way to really understand what your exposure and visibility is to the adversary. I get so frustrated when I hear people go in and say, oh, the adversary is unstoppable. There's nothing you can do about it. They are going to target you. They are going to break in, and they're going to compromise your environment. That is false. Now, yes, in this day and age, organizations will go in and be targeted. It's going to happen. But if you're focusing on the right areas, you can absolutely minimize and contain the damage. So let me just get this out of the way. In the year 2014, you are going to be targeted, you are going to be attacked, you are going to be compromised. Deal with it. It's a fact. So I always get frustrated when I see these reports. 95% of all Fortune 50 companies have been compromised, and the other 5% just don't know about it. And I read this going, is that supposed to be profound? That that would be like going in and saying, 95% of everybody who's alive in the United States has gotten sick, and the other 5% just don't know they got sick. You'd be like, duh, of course, everybody gets sick. Nobody's approach to life is saying you will never get sick. If anybody walks up to you and says, I will never get sick for the rest of my life, you'll laugh at them. That's naive. It's not factual. Our approach to life is not saying we won't get sick. Our approach to life is minimizing the impact and the likely, sorry, min minimizing the frequency and the impact in which we get sick. That's the approach we need to take to security. We need to recognize that you are going to be broken into. Therefore, we need to put more and more energy on detection and incident response because, yes, prevention is ideal, but detection is the must. So what you want to do is you want to look at what's coming in to your organization and try to prevent anything that's bad. Then you want to watch what's leaving your organization and try to detect any command control channels, any data leakage, anything that could be impactful to your organization. And log correlation with anomaly detection is key. Then finally, we need common metrics in order 
to go in and have effective security. We are right now with the CSO, the Chief Security Officer, we were where CIOs were 20 years ago. In the late 80s, early 90s, when companies started becoming dependent on computers, CIOs started to get more and more maturity. What was the turning point for CIOs really being a mature, focused area for the organization? When they came up with a metric, which is five nines. We all know, anyone who's done CIO work knows that it's all about uptime availability. Five nines, 99.999% of time availability is what a lot of CIOs focus on. That metric allowed there to be consistency across the environment. The executives know how to measure the CIO. The CIO knows what to deliver against, and that's what allowed them to be mature. We need those metrics with security. We need ways to go in and verify and validate what's being done. What's the problem today? IT is doing one thing. Auditors are measuring something different. Executives are saying, can anyone tell me what's going on? And security? Yeah, we're pissing everybody off. Right? We need common metrics that security can define, IT can implement, auditors can validate, and executives can understand within the environment. So the critical controls were based off of three main premises of offense informing the defense. They needed to be metrics that could be measured, and they need to be automated within the environment. Now, yes, right now there are 20 categories of controls, each with subcontrols that focus on the specific implementation steps that need to be done. As I mentioned, in our previous webcast, we have walked through these different areas. In today's webcast, we're going to focus in on the four controls that will allow us to better manage user risk within our environment. Controlling the use of administrative privileges, which is control 12. Maintaining, monitoring, and auditing uh, analysis of audit laws, control 14. Controlled access based on need to know and 16, account monitoring and control. So basically, we're controlling who has access, what they can do, what they're allowed to perform at what access level, and monitoring and tracking and looking for any anomalies or deviations. So with Critical Control 12, many people, when they read this, they misunderstand. They always go, oh, Eric, we're limiting the number of people with administrative access to our environment. That's awesome. That's great. That's not Critical Control 12. Critical Control 12 says yes. Limiting the number of people with administrative access is important, but what 12 is about is only using the administrative access when it's absolutely required. Don't go in and do anything at a more privileged level unless it's absolutely needed. Whenever you're performing any activity on the network, always go in and do it at the minimalistic level that's possible and needed. So the way attackers exploit this control is what are the two most dangerous applications on planet Earth? Now, I was teaching this a few weeks ago at a conference, and a student yells out, angry birds. And I'm sitting there going, OK, they're probably right. So besides Angry Birds, what are the two most dangerous applications on planet Earth? I would say web browsers and email clients. <coughs> they are the source of most evil. So we never, ever want to run our email clients or our web, web browsers as administrative access. Many people do. So attackers are going to go in and find people running these dangerous applications as a privileged user, which allows them to get instant access to their environment. So when we look at the defensive goals, I'm not going to read each sub-control to you, because the critical controls is a public, open document. I've listed the URL, and you can easily go in and read 
up on that yourself. What I want to do is sort of focus in on what are the key defensive takeaways for Critical Control 12. The first one, and I will warn you, when I say this first item, there will be rioting in the streets and some users' heads will explode. Users can never, ever be given administrative access to their computer. Boom! Someone's head just exploded. And let's just break this down. If users can log in as administrative access to their system, game over. Why? What can administrators do? Anything. So how in the world can you do configuration management? How can you go in and lock down the software? How can you control change? How can you go in and require endpoint security running if users have total control and can modify, change, or alter anything on their systems? And I will fight this one. It is not needed. Just because some users have had it for 10 years doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. We have to control and create a safe environment for those users. Then we need to make sure that they never run anything like email, web, or internet access as administrator. And any time they're going to be installing or running anything as a privileged user, that needs to be done in a control managed sandbox within their environment. Then critical control 14. This one is to me one of the most important. If you read the entire document on the critical controls and you read every sub control very, very closely, the one most reoccurring theme that you see in almost every single control is you must log this event. You must log, you must correlate, you must analyze. Why? You cannot prevent every adversary today. Some attackers will sneak in. There is no way to prevent and stop every attack. Therefore, in cases where we can't prevent, we need to detect in a timely manner. How do you detect a compromise? By looking at the events. What is the definition of an incident? An incident is an adverse event or the threat of an adverse event to your organization. What are events? Entries in your log files. So if you don't have the logs, you don't have the events, and if you don't have the events, you have no clue what's happening within your organization. So if we're saying that detection is critical to success, and the main way of detecting an adversary is by looking at the logs, this becomes super high priority critical. Now, I'll even take it a step further. When I give keynote addresses at various conferences and different groups, one of the questions I always get asked, which isn't really a fair question, but I find that you always need to do that separate of answering it is, Eric, across the board, what are the biggest security holes you see across all organizations that you work with? So if you had to summarize across banks, healthcare, control systems, manufacturers, what are the one or two biggest problems across the board? My answer always is, right now, data classification, or sorry, lack of data classification, and lack of logging and correlation within your environment. To me, the two fundamental issues is one, organizations don't know what or where their critical information is. I covered that in my intro. And second, they're not logging, correlating, or analyzing the logs to understand where the biggest exposures are. If you don't have the logs, you don't know what's happening in your organization. And the way attackers exploit this is they know you're not doing it. So they can break in and not get caught. This is one we have to be real careful with. I recently saw some of the new breach data that came out. And one of the things it shows is that the number of attacks that we're detecting has decreased. So you have some people miss 
read that data going, wow, we're finally starting to see the sun break in the clouds, right? There's not stormy days ahead. The number of attacks are decreasing. No, 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 no. That's not what the data says. If you really read into it, what the data is saying is we are detecting less attacks than we did last year. I'll tell you right now, the adversaries have not gone home. They have not retired. They have not stopped breaking into systems. The number of attacks are increasing. The problem is they're getting more stealthy, and as organizations don't log the way that they should, they're not catching the attacks that they should. So it's giving this false impression that we're actually seeing a decline in the number of attacks, which is not true. We're seeing a decline in our ability to actually go in and detect and find the adversary, which makes this control even more important. So when we go in and we're looking at defending against this, you need to go in and say, what are those critical systems? And what are the minimal logs that we need in order to effectively detect and find adversaries within our environment and then start going in and making sure that we can cross-correlate that information. Now, in order to cross-correlate that information, we need to have a consistent time source, like a network time protocol, to cross-correlate that information or data together. Now, what I love about doing webcasts like this is we get to cover a lot of ground in an hour. The problem is we only have an hour. So I just want to make sure you recognize each one of these controls, I'm giving you two or three critical things you need to do with each control. But you should absolutely be reading the entire document because we have full classes that I teach on this, and I literally spend three hours on each one of these individual controls that I'm doing in about five minutes just to give you the quick takeaway. Critical control 15 is one of two controls focusing on data and information. Critical control 15 is all about having data classification and knowing what data sits on what devices and who has access to what. So critical control 15 is focused on data at rest. And critical control 17, which is data loss prevention, is focused at data in motion. So because we're focusing on the user-based risk, we're not actually going to cover the DLP in this presentation, but we're going to focus in on the first part, which is controlling and managing your data at rest. What is your critical information, and where does it reside? Many attackers recognize that networks are pretty flat and open. So when they can go and find one system that's weak, they could break in and use that to pivot and do internal recon within the environment. This is what makes it tricky. If your organization is not highly segmented and pieces that don't have critical data are on the same network and can see devices that have critical data, what's the fallacy? Organizations are putting all this energy and effort into securing and locking down the critical systems that have the data on it. What's the problem? The systems that don't have critical data, they're not protecting. But once they get broken into, the adversary now has a pivot point behind your perimeter, and they can directly target and attack those other systems. So unless we highly segment out our systems with critical data on separate isolated networks, then any weak system could potentially target and be used to cause harm. So our goal is we need to have data classification. Now, I know when many people hear data classification, ah, too hard, too difficult, we're not the government. No, no, no. I'm not saying you got to go crazy here. Really, what we're talking about data classification is a simple question. There's basically two types of information, public and private. There's some information that has to leave your organization and be publicly accessible in order to run the business. 
and there has to be some information that's private and can never leave the organization or it would cause harm. If you don't differentiate between those two categories and do some basic classification, question how are you going to allow some information to leave the environment and other information not to? You can't. So you basically have to determine what information can and what information can't leave your environment and then segment and separate out from a data flow perspective. The other thing that I mentioned earlier is you need to segment off critical information. You can't have one big, flat, open network. We need to go in and highly segment out based on trust or classification. So only people with the proper access can go after that data, and it can never flow into other areas, other networks, most importantly, flow out to the Internet. Then the final control we're going to look at is critical control 16, which is really a superset of 12. 12 was saying, okay, let's focus on administrators. Anyone with privileged access we want to focus in on. But question, is it normal user access privileged over a guest or outsider? Absolutely. So even though an attacker ultimately wants administrative access, if they can get a regular user account, they can still go in and do a lot of damage. So critical control 16 is our superset that's really focusing in on controlling all access, all accounts, and making sure that any accounts that are not needed are removed or taken off the system. So the problem here is most organizations have extra accounts for people that no longer work at the organization. Many of these accounts are not disabled, and many of them have weak passwords. Remember, for an adversary to break in, they don't have to find 3,000 accounts with weak passwords. They only have to find one. That's what makes the defense so hard, because we got to always find that weakest link that's out there and protect it. So our defense is, with Critical Control 16, is knowing all the accounts on the system, expiring accounts that are no longer needed, disable dormant accounts, and have strict controls with password length, complexity, change interval, and account lockout. So if somebody does try to break in, they can cause harm. Sorry, if somebody does try to break in, it minimizes the amount of harm, and then monitor account activity and look for any unusual, strange anomalies that might be happening on those systems. The bottom line is, let's stop making ourselves an easy target. Right? Let's stop making it easy for the adversary. Let's change the game. Right now the game is advantage offense. By doing these things that we've talked about and focusing in on metrics-based security, we can actually create an environment where advantage defense. And that's what we need to do. We control the environment. So why are we going in if we're creating the playing field? Why are we creating a playing field that helps the offense out? Let's change that playing field and make it easier for us to be successful and harder for the adversary. And by going in and doing these metrics is exactly how we do that. Once again, I'm finished with my portion, so if you have any follow-on questions or discussions you want to have with me, that's my contact information. We will do a few questions at the end, but at this point, I want to turn it over to Beyond Trust, and Chris will talk about some of the ways that their solutions can directly solve the problems that we just laid out. And I believe Chris is going to come on the line. So if not, I can go in. Hey guys, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was muted. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And while I get this loaded up, um, I'll give you some fodder uh, for your next webcast, Eric. I grew up in Jersey as a Giants fan, Phil Sims fan, and Woo then I moved to Massachusetts in '95, Bledsoe days, and I drank the Kool Aid and I jumped ship. So. 
Next time we do a webcast together, you can chew on that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so a anyway, th thanks, Eric. It, really great presentation, even though you're, you're still a Giants fan. Um, as, as Eric mentioned, my name's Chris, uh, and I'm a marketing director at Beyond Trust. I'm just going to take about five or six minutes uh, before we get to the Q&A to give you a quick intro to uh, Beyond Trust solutions. And um, first I'll tell you a little bit about the problems we address with this really simplified graphic. And it depicts how we see attackers combining asset and user exposures to conduct some of la today's large-scale data breaches. And, you know, in these scenarios, you know, Eric's been talking about it. We all know it, how it happens. An external attacker might take uh, advantage of a vulnerability on a relatively low-level asset, maybe starting with a phishing or another uh, type of client-side attack. And often that's all he or she needs to uh, gain a foothold in the environment. And in organizations with privilege management challenges, like those organizations that give all their end users admin privileges on their machines, um, the attacker then could take advantage of those excessive user privileges and traverse the network until they find those higher value uh, crown jewels. So Beyond Trust Solutions address both uh, these asset and user base risks. And of course there are many recommendations out there regarding what to do about these issues and um, as Eric's just been talking about, one of the most highly regarded and widely adapted uh, guidelines is the SANS uh, Top 20 Critical Security Controls. And we offer solutions that have coverage uh, for about 10 of those 20 uh, controls. And specifically, those are the controls that are related to reducing asset and Uh, previous webcast that Eric hosted for us, uh, I encourage you to check it out. There's a registration-free link to it on our site. I believe we're sending out a link to it um, with the recording of this webcast as well. That covers how um, uh, that covers the controls that are focused on asset risk management, and then of course today we just focused on those covering user risk management. And uh, we also have a white paper on how we cover this on our website. So. Beyond Trust addresses uh, external asset targeted threats and those internal user based threats. And these two areas traditionally years ago were managed by separate groups within the organization, IT and security. And lately, you know, we're starting to see more and more collaboration between IT operations and security teams when it comes to reducing risk. And we've therefore integrated our solutions into a unified platform that delivers um, risk analytics that concern both user and asset security exposures in your environment. So as a re result, um, both our IT operations and our security customers uh, are able to work together to gain a better understanding of the risks facing the organizations. And I'll give you a brief overview of these solutions. Um, and that starts with Power Broker. And Power Broker is our family of privileged account management solutions. And IT professionals, uh, specifically op IT operations, usually use Power Broker to enforce and audit access control policies, uh, you know, implementing things like least privilege, um, only allowing people to have administrative privileges for the tasks that they need. Um, and this enables them to limit access to key systems, applications, and data without obstructing user productivity. Uh, and then, of course, we have Retina, and Retina is our family of vulnerability management solutions. And security experts use Retina to identify um, vulnerabilities and other IT security weaknesses across network, web, virtual, database, and mobile environments. And this enables them to assess risk, measure breach likelihood, and make remediation recommendations. So Retina also offers um, integrated patch management, endpoint protection, and it has um, several compliance reporting capabilities, uh, including multiple reports uh, specific to PCI, HIPAA, SOX, you know, you, you name it. Um, you guys are familiar with the acronyms. Um, so we have a few types of power broker privileged account management products. Um, we've got uh, traditional privilege management solutions um, for partitioning and managing privileged and shared accounts on Unix, Linux, and Windows servers. 
Um, we also have um, desktop privilege management solutions for controlling window, Windows admin privileges and managing those least privileged deployments across your end users. Uh, we've got an AD bridging solution that allows uh, your Unix, Linux, and Mac users to authenticate via Active Directory. Um, we've got a family of auditing and protection tools that track changes to Active Directory file system SQL and Exchange. Uh, we've got a password management or password vaulting solution that manages privileged passwords, it rotates passwords, it audits password activity. And then on the vulnerability management side, we've got a few um, main product offerings. Um, we've got our Retina CS Enterprise Vulnerability Management solution. And that's really for large scale dis uh, distributed vulnerability assessment and re remediation um, with centralized management, reporting, analytics, um, all those platform capabilities. Um, the scanning engine that we have that you can also use separately is the Retina Network Security Scanner. Despite its name, it also, um, in addition to scanning uh, network IPs, it'll scan uh, web, database, and virtual assets. Um, we've got a cloud-based scanning solution called Beyond SaaS, um, and that's for scanning your network perimeter and public-facing web apps, or web applications, I should say. And um, we also have a, a specialized DAST uh, web security scanner that's designed to uh, more comprehensively assess your custom web apps. Um, so with Beyond Insight, um, we layer in a, an overarching risk management platform, and that provides centralized management for many of our power broker and retina solutions, allowing them to talk to each other, allowing you to aggregate data from our multiple solutions and boil that up into analytics and reports. Um, and it also brings in some centralized capabilities uh, like asset discovery, profiling, and grouping, uh, reporting and analytics, like I just mentioned, uh, workflow and ticketing, and then, of course, that data sharing between our solutions for vulnerability management and privileged account management. And the idea here is that Beyond Insight enables user risk to inform asset risk and vice versa. Uh, so, for instance, you can set rules within our Power Broker for Windows product to automatically lock down access to a particular system based on the vulnerabilities uh, found on that application that the user is trying to launch. Um, so uh, slide in front of you, we're talking about um, the term context awareness. And you'll see that in, on our website, you'll see it in a lot of our marketing materials, but it's, it's not just marketing fluff. There are a couple ways that we do deliver on this. Uh, the first way is, uh, was mentioned on the previous slide, and that's that by unifying our privilege and vulnerability management capabilities, we tell you that an asset um, not only has a particular vulnerability on it, but also how privileged accounts for that asset could open doors to the rest of your network. Um, a second way that our solutions del deliver on that context awareness is that they take several unique factors about your business into account when analyzing and reporting on risk in your environment. Um, and we help you to evaluate risk not only on those external factors like you see listed on the left, but also on those internal factors you see on the right, um, like your organization's compliance requirements or your confidentiality or data integrity requirements for specific assets. Um, so that's just a quick overview. Um, we're going to throw up a poll question now, and you know I just gave you a 50,000 foot overview on our products. Um, we do have, of course, we'll offer one-on-one -on -one demonstrations for you with a rep and to talk more about you know your specific environment and how we might help. Um, and we also offer free trials um, of most of our solutions as well. So if you're interested in getting your hands on a trial or you wanted to talk to somebody um, more specifically about your needs. Uh, this is just an opportunity for you to let us know now. And um, I think Sarah is going to throw up that poll question. It's just a yes or no question. Um, of course, if you have any questions um, after the webcast, um, check out our website. There's plenty of ways to get in touch with us, and there are plenty of um, trial registration opportunities as well. And, Perfect. Um, Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so the poll is up for, right now. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, I see 45% have voted so far, so come on, guys. Um, 
Don't make me cry after this webcast. Let's get you guys participating. Um, so I have I had a bunch of questions come in. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to try to go through these really quick. Eric, what is the difference between a network diagram and a network visibility map? Uh, excellent. So a network diagram is where you're actually showing the physical connectivity of all the devices within your environment. So you're actually going in showing routers and switches and actually interconnectivity between all of the different devices within the environment. A network visibility map is a higher level view of what systems are visible from what perspective. So with a network visibility map, you don't have routers or switches in there. You're literally just looking at what IP addresses are visible from what perspective, what ports are open, what services are running, and uh, what level of access somebody could get in. So the network visibility map is used to understand your exposure. The network diagram is used to determine how to fix the problem. And the reason I differentiate it is the network visibility map, if you use Retina or any of those great tools from Beyond Trust, you can build this out literally in hours. A network diagram could take weeks or months to do, so it's a quick way to understand where your exposures are. Eric, would you elaborate more on outbound detection? Uh, absolutely. So most organizations, when they implement and roll out security, it's focused on what's coming into the organization. Well, inbound prevention is great because you want to look for signatures, you want to look for known attack patterns, you want to block, block, block what's coming in. The problem is inbound traffic is also very, very noisy. So if you're trying to look or detect adversaries on what's coming in, it's going to be really, really hard. But if we're ultimately trying to detect a compromised system, if we're trying to detect a system that has harmful things going on, when does data get stolen? When does data get exfiltrated out of the organization? When do command channels get set up? Outbound, outbound, outbound. So what you want to do is you want to look at what's leaving your organization, where it's going, and look for any anomalies in the length of connections, the number of connections, and the amount of data leaving a specific client going out to the internet, and as soon as you see those anomalies, those are one of the best ways to catch compromised systems. Great. So we actually have to cut this. Um, it is at the top of the hour. So um, any of the questions that you guys sent in, we'll forward them over um, to Eric or to Chris to answer, and we will get back to you guys um, with uh, answers later on. So um, real quick, just to let you guys know, remember you will be receiving the um, recording to the webcast and a link to the slides later this week or maybe early next week. So be on the lookout from that, um, from an email from Beyond Trust. So with that, I'd like to wrap this up. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Chris, so much for being here today. Um, it was really insightful and we always, it's always a pleasure to have you um, talking about um, these topics with us. So thanks, Eric, for being here, and thank you all for joining us and taking a little over an hour of your day um, with us. We really appreciate it. We know you're all busy, so thank you, and yeah, let's get uh, number four scheduled with you, Eric. <laughs> we always have so Sounds much Sounds great. Now. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Thanks so much, you guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.